Uh, good morning, everyone. It's great to be here. Uh, it was really exciting to fly in yesterday. Uh, I spent a lot of time here. I, was, um, I did my undergrad up in New Hampshire, and so I was always flying in and out of Boston. This was the, the closest city that we had, so it felt like my city, and it's, so it feels nice to be home. Um, the, and actually, before we start talking about Particle and the Internet of Things and our business, I want to talk about why we're here. Right? Why did we choose to uh, come over to the East Coast and have our uh, presentations this year in Pittsburgh and in Boston? And I'll start with a little bit of backstory. Whoop. So last year, we hosted our first event, which was called Spectra. We did so in San Francisco. And it was really great for the first time to get our customers together in one room, right? where there are a lot of people developing IoT products, building them all over the world, all over the country. And we're able to get a couple hundred people together to start having conversations with each other about the problems they were facing, what challenges they were trying to overcome, whether it's on the technology side or on the business side. We did some great workshops introducing new products. And overall, it was clear to us that this is something that we need to continue doing. We need to keep bringing our customers together for these kinds of events. However, one of the things that's uh, been true of the business for a while, but especially recently, is that more and more we're seeing our customers on the East Coast. Right now, if you look at our existing customer base, it's about 50-50 split. We sort of, you know, split the country in half and say, where are our customers? Well, about half are on the West Coast and about half are on the East Coast. But one of the things that's starting to change is if you look forward, you look at the folks that we're talking to now about building relationships over the next couple of years, and the East Coast is really starting to take over. You might wa ask, why is that the case? We're a technology company. We're based in San Francisco. There's obviously a tradition of sort of the technology focus in the San Francisco Bay Area. Why are we seeing this shift happen? Well. In a lot of ways, I think this is a natural reflection of the actual state of the market of IoT, right? So we're in San Francisco. As a result, we naturally talk to the people who are closest to us, right? So we get to know people in our local environment. But as we started to build out our team, we started to put boots on the ground all over the country, all over the world, closer to our customers. I think what we're seeing is something that more naturally rep reflects the actual state of the industry. So this, this showcase of where our prospective customers is I think is reflective of where the IoT market is, that it is more on the East Coast than it is on the West Coast. I think the reason for that is that the Internet of Things is the intersection of technology and manufacturing, right? And there's a, you know, there's a sentiment that technology is so focused in the Bay Area, which I don't think is necessarily true. And in fact, if you look, this is from the US Bureau of Labor Statistics, um, looking at jobs in the information sector, which essentially is technology, and in manufacturing. And what you see is technology is a lot more widely dispersed than it's often discussed, right? Which is to say there are technology companies everywhere. There are engineers and technology jobs all over the country, extremely broadly distributed. And so you do sort of see an even split between West Coast and East Coast on technology. But manufacturing is more heavily on the East Coast, right? And when people are building IoT products, it's that, it's that intersection between manufacturing a physical product and introducing technology to connect that product to the internet that would suggest, well, that, that's why we're starting to see more and more activity on the East Coast. And so we decided this year, instead of having customers come to us, we want to come to you. And we picked two locations, Pittsburgh and Boston, for a bunch of reasons, which is to say we were already seeing customers, in a, a lot of customers in these two cities. Um, there were sort of hot spots, both for our developer community and for our customers building products at scale. And part of that is due to the history of, of these two cities, right? So both cities lay claim to the beginnings of the Internet of Things. Pittsburgh, uh, CMU, was the place where the first quote unquote IoT product existed. It was a, uh, calling it a product is a strong word. Um, it was a Coke machine in the student lounge that you could tell that into and, uh, and get information about what was in there and then drop a Coke which is not the most useful IoT product because who wants a vending machine to drop a Coke when nobody's standing in front of it? Um, but, you know, students, uh, that's, it was the first internet-connected product, at least, you know, at least that we know of, right? And then, of course, Boston, MIT, and generally all the incredible universities that are here. But the term Internet of Things was coined by a gentleman who went, to, who went on to found Auto ID Labs at MIT, um, which helped bring sort of RFID to market in the way that we think of it today and was in a lot of ways sort of birthplace of the modern day Internet of Things. Um, and actually, before we go on, one thing to highlight is that we've 
Um, we believe so much in this market. We're opening an office in, in Boston. Um, that office will open on October 1st. Uh, we're in the State Street building uh, and just checked out our, our new office today. Um, and so we'll be, we will be spending more time here with you. Um, and by the way, if you're interested in jobs, we are hiring out here. Uh, and our recruiting table would love to talk to you. Um, but Boston is becoming more and more of an important place for us. So now before we go on, I want to talk about what Particle does. Right? So most of you, by being in this room, you probably already know us. Um, but for those of you who are just getting to know Particle for the first time, just learning about us, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about what we do and what sets us apart. And Particle is the number one full stack IoT platform to power a connected product. So if you're building some kind of product, some kind of machine, you want those products to be internet connected, you want to, you want to work with a partner who can provide a very comprehensive solution for you that cuts across hardware and software and connectivity, Particle is the way to do so. We have the largest developer community in the industry. We have 175,000 individual engineers building products with Particle, representing 8,500 companies that cut across a huge variety of industries and products. And you can see that if we highlight some of our customers, energy, medical, consumer, industrial, mobility. And whenever I put this up, I always think like, this is sort of like everything, right? Um, but that is, of course, both the opportunity and the challenge with Internet of Things, is that when we're talking about connecting physical products and assets, we really could be talking about anything, right? And we very much see that with our customers, that they connect a huge variety of products. We'll talk about more of those as we go through this presentation, and you'll be hearing from some of our customers later today. But to really dig, on, dig in on what we do, I'll use an example of a customer of ours called Jacuzzi. Now, you probably know the name Jacuzzi. It's often become synonymous with the hot tub. And Jacuzzi is the largest manufacturer of hot tubs uh, um, in the world. Uh, Jacuzzi launched in 2017 a connected product called Smart Tub, which now allows customers of this product to be able to control it remotely. Now, remote control of products can sometimes be a little gimmicky and novelty, like do I really need to control it from my phone? But in this case, it's really valuable because hot tubs are a big consumer of energy. If you own one and you have it on and heated, that's, that's consuming a, a pretty large amount of energy. Of course, it takes a while to heat up. So one of the problems is if you own a hot tub, either you leave it on all the time because you want to use it, or you leave it off all the time because you're trying to save energy which means that either you're saving energy and not using it, or you're using it and losing energy, right? So by having this product be connected, their customers can control it remotely. They can turn it on in advance. And so you leave it off when you don't need it. If you were planning on using it today, you could turn it on now. It would heat up over the course of the day and be ready for you when you get home. It's a really valuable application. Their customers have been really excited about it. OK, so this is an example of a product that would be built with Particle. Well, well what do we do? Well, we're providing the technology stack that cuts across um, uh, all the layers of the stack to connect this product, the hot tub, to this application, the phone, that, um, that you're using to control it. If we go layer by layer through the stack, embedded inside the hot tub is a little box that says Smart Tub on it. Inside that is one of our connectivity modules. In this case, these are cellular connected products, and we're providing hardware that uh, provides compute and connectivity embedded inside the product that runs our edge computing stack, which we call Device OS. Device OS is our uh, operating system that runs inside the device. It abstracts the physical hardware, the sensors, provides libraries for interacting with various sensors and control systems, and an environment for Jacuzzi to run a software application that in this case can communicate with all the various systems inside the tub, whether it's the jets or the motors, um, reading information from the sensors, whatever it might be. Device OS connects to our device cloud through our communication protocol. So when the device is powered on, it's online. And it's available through an API and communicating with other web services. We're taking care of things like communications and security and networking through our communication stack. And in many cases, for our cellular connected customers, we're also providing SIM cards and data plans. We are what's called an MVNO, a mobile virtual network operator, which essentially means we're a carrier. So we can provide SIM cards that work all over the world that are incorporated with the rest of the product. The devices can all be managed and controlled through our device management console. So you can log in, you can see all of your devices, you can push out software updates, make sure they're healthy, fix problems when they arise. And all the devices are exposed through an API. So if you're the software developer who's building out this software application, 
You can use our iOS SDK, our Android SDK, our JavaScript SDK, whatever programming language you're comfortable with. You can build the software application to interact with that product. And you don't need to know anything about what's happening in the hardware. That's abstracted behind the API. You're interacting with a, a modern REST API to interact with that product. We have a new product called the Rules Engine that creates an environment where you can cr define a set of rules in a drag and drop interface to run a lot of the business logic of the product. So for instance, if the temperature goes past some level, then raise a ticket in service cloud so that somebody, um, uh, somebody knows that they need to go out and fix the machine. And this is often the integration point with other systems our customers already have, right? A lot of our, comp our customers are companies that have been in business for a long time. They have systems in place. They have a CRM, they have ERP systems, whatever it might be. And this becomes the integration point to connect these products to other IT systems. The reason this is valuable is that we can solve a huge variety of, te of technical problems. One of the challenges with IoT is there's a lot of things that can go wrong. There's a lot of ways to do it wrong and only one way to do it right. And so most IoT initiatives fail somewhere along the way because of a variety of technical challenges. And it might be issues with antennas, it might be issues with certifications, it might be issues with security. It could happen in a lot of places. We can solve all those problems. We can also solve some of the more challenging problems that really cut across the whole stack. So security, for instance. Securing an IoT product is obviously very important. It's also challenging because these are distributed systems that are out in the world, right? You can't just put it in a data center and lock it up and say it's all protected in this little box. These are products that are out in the field. And so security is really important and, and needs to be delivered end to end, right? So we secure the device, we secure the cloud, we secure everything in between. Diagnosing connectivity issues. Uh, you'll be hearing from Will, our head of product, and he'll talk more about what we do to, uh, to help people discover and identify and address connectivity issues, and delivering over-the-air software updates. So these products can be changed and updated at any point after it's been shipped to customers. And Jacuzzi is a great example of a customer where they were able to bring this product to market in six months, from napkin drawing to product in customers' hands. They're saving $2 million a year on the reduced cost of maintenance, the dealers who sell the hot tubs and are responsible for fixing them have better information about what's happening inside the tub. So when they show up to fix something, they know what to fix instead of needing to sort of figure that out beforehand. And they also saw a, a revenue lift. They're able to charge more for their products when they include the smart tub because customers recognize that they'll save on, on their energy bill and they're willing to pay, pay that premium for that product. Okay, so that's particle. Now let's step back and talk about the Internet of Things. So we believe, and I expect you do too if you're here in this room, that this Internet of Things thing is a, is a thing, right? This is something that, uh, this is a big movement and an opportunity to connect a huge variety of products. But why now and what exactly did this come from? Well, in a lot of ways we look at IoT as being a natural conclusion to what's been happening in computing for decades which is that computers just keep getting smaller and cheaper and lower power, and the places that you can put them are expanding. So in the 70s and 80s, we finally got computers that were small enough to put on our desks. Instead of sharing a computer, we could each have our own. And that starts with the Altair 8800 in 1975, and then it grows through the 70s and 80s with Commodore 64 and TRS-80 and Apple II and all of the ways that we were introduced to personal computers before DOS and Mac OS and the things that we think of now as being sort of modern computers. Now, of course, following that, computers kept getting smaller and more powerful, and that meant that desktops became laptops, and eventually laptops started to get pretty small, and eventually we started putting them in our pockets, right? We started having computers that we carry around, starting with the, arguably the introduction of the iPhone in 2007, where the smartphone really became a thing, and became an even larger industry than the personal computer revolution that, that preceded it. Right? So now, of course, you've got Apple, you've got Samsung, all the variety of players that put phones in our pockets. But essentially, it's just a continuation of that same technology trend, computers getting smaller and more powerful. And that continues as they get smaller and, more, and, and lower cost and lower power until you can start to put them in other products. Right? Um, so, the, so the Internet of Things was driven first by Moore's Law, which is to say that as computing the cost of computing comes down, you can put computers in more places. Second, by ubiquitous connectivity. Also driven by the smartphone, connectivity is everywhere. Started with Wi-Fi. When I went to college, uh, when I was an undergrad, they, so we're celebrating the fact that my school was one of the first schools to have Wi-Fi everywhere, 
right? And these days, the idea that somebody would celebrate that they have Wi-Fi is ridiculous, right? Of course they have Wi-Fi. It's, it's 2019. Wi-Fi networks are ubiquitous. Cellular networks are ubiquitous. This is AT&T's coverage map, which basically is just blue, right? Everywhere has cellular. And I always, when I look at these maps, I always want to know, like, where, what is going on in these places that don't have cellular connectivity? It must be like a mountain range or a desert. There can't be people there, because these days there is connectivity literally everywhere. And then, of course, the problems that we experience in the physical world haven't been resolved, right? This is a customer of ours called Ultrac. Ultrac connects wind machines. So you may or may not be familiar with these machines that often sit above vineyards or other high-value crops. Uh, they look like sort of small wind turbines. They're wind machines. They're big fans. And the reason they exist is that towards the end of a season in a vineyard, as the temperature starts to dip, if the frost settles too early, it can destroy the crop before you finish the harvest. Now, the way that you protect against the frost is with a giant fan. Basically, if you blow air, if you create airflow over the vineyard, the frost doesn't settle on the grapes. And so you can protect them long enough to finish the harvest, and then you turn the machine off. Super valuable machine, really important. They protect, on average, a quarter million dollars of crops. Now, the problem is they fail 5% of the time. And why do they fail? Well, they're really only used once a year. You turn it on every October when you're finishing your harvest, and then you turn it off, and you leave it off until the temperatures drop again. Now, in the intervening year, a lot of things might have happened. The power line might have been cut. There might be rust or other mechanical issues. It doesn't really matter what the problem was. It's just that you don't discover it until the day that you turn the machine on. Right? So you need the machine on October 5th. You go turn it on. It doesn't work. You lose the crop. What Alltrack does is they connect into these wind machines, and they turn them on every once in a while, run some tests, and turn it back off. In doing so, they're able to completely address this problem, right? Because when the machine breaks, they fix it when it breaks instead of when they need it. And as a result, the machine works when you need it. It's not all that complicated, right? But it wasn't possible until these machines could be connected, right? And be, these problems that exist in the physical world, the day-to-day -day problems of interacting with physical products haven't been addressed because these products haven't been brought online. So these three things, the declining cost of computers, ubiquitous connectivity, and the continued existence of these pesky problems in the physical world result in investment and growth of the Internet of Things. Which means we should connect everything, right? This is, a, this is the Internet of Things landscape in 2018. Uh, there's an investor named Matt Turk out of New York who every year puts together a view of the Internet of Things. And this view has become increasingly challenging to see. And you're probably looking at this and saying, these logos are too small for me to actually read any of them, which is sort of the point, right? Um, 400 plus companies on this in a variety of categories that are also probably too small to see. Um, but what I think is fascinating about this is if you pick any individual category here, let's take in the home applications gardening, which is this one here, there's five logos there, five companies that support their customers in some kind of gardening product in the home, right? There's five logos here. I can tell you there's another 50, 100 companies behind them that weren't included on this list. And that's true of every single category here. So this says that there's you know, 500 companies. There's a lot more than that. There's tens of thousands of companies across a huge variety of applications that are trying to connect physical products. And sometimes those really pop, right? So we've seen this with micromobility. This is a customer of ours called Keep Going that's uh, in Korea and has launched a micromobility product. And these have, you know, if you talk about connecting everything, right, this is a product that's come from nowhere. Uh, I assume they're, they're here, right? Uh, scooters and bikes sort of out in the world. And you, you might have mixed feelings about this. Uh, they're an incredible way to get around, and they, they address one of the biggest challenges of traffic, which is that as the cost of driving has gone down, as Lyft and Uber have made it easier to get around, they've added cars to the road, and that's made traffic worse, not better which means that the bike lane is now often the only way to get around that isn't blocked by a bunch of cars. And fundamentally, you know, the reducing the cost of computing, the cost of uh, connectivity, and also the cost of lithium batteries uh, coming down has made these products possible and created a new way of, of moving around. So some categories are popping in a way that's very visible to us as consumers. We see these. We, we trip over them on the street. They're written about all the time. 
And if you look at industry analytics, you'll see a huge variety of numbers about how big this industry is or is going to be. And those numbers are always in the hundreds of billions or the trillions of dollars and sometimes feel a little silly because you're like, how could that be true yet? But this is, a, this is a Bain & Company. I think they do a good job of being aggressive but conservative. They say that right now it's about a 200 something billion dollar market. It'll be $500 billion market in 2021. So doubling over that period, which is obviously a lot of growth, and a lot, and a lot of that growth coming from the sort of software uh, end of the world, right? So this is the legacy embedded systems that they're including in the Internet of Things, which is sort of flat, right? But then all the other categories are growing. There's a lot of growth that's, expected to, that's happening now and is expected to happen over the next few years. But it's not all roses. In the same industry report that Bain & Company created, they, were, they asked a bunch of questions about adoption. They surveyed customers and said, who's actually doing this? Who's creating products today? And when do you expect that you will be investing really meaningfully in the Internet of Things? And of course, as you might expect, there's some percentage of people who, when they got the survey, said they were. And then in the future, the further out you ask, the more and more people say, yes, by then we probably will have done some IoT stuff. But one of the things I think is important is that this survey was done twice, once in 2016, once in 2018. And in both cases, they asked, what do you think about 2020, right? How much do you think you will have invested in 2020? And in 2016, they said, pretty much all of us think that we're going to be meaningfully investing in IoT by 2020. And then as 2020 got closer, uh, maybe we won't have gotten there yet, right? It's, uh, people are starting to like, pull back a little bit, which is a little concerning. And you also see that in the Gartner hype cycle. So Gartner tracks a lot of different industries and they have this way of thinking about the adoption of new technologies called the hype cycle, which is to say new innovations are triggered and then get a lot of hype and people are really excited about them, the peak of infl inflated expectations. And then you realize that maybe it's not quite ready for prime time yet and so you fall into the trough of disillusionment, great names for these, uh, and then climb the slope of enlightenment onto the plateau of productivity. There's a reason this, this stuck around. They're good with words. Um, now, the Internet of Things is not in the, in the place you necessarily want it to be in this view, right, which is just dropping into the trough of disillusionment, which says that we're in for, we're in for a, a tough couple years, right, before we really start to see this industry take off. Now, what we see, we have a, we have a unique view on the industry. Uh, one of the challenges, I think, of, an, of being an analyst in this space or any is you're trying to sort of ask a lot of people and capture a lot of insight about what's happening to figure out where you are in the adoption of this technology. And what we see, and we've seen since we started the company in 2013, is an incredible amount of activity, right? A huge amount of projects and products just being started, and that activity has not declined in any way. In fact, it's growing, right? We see more and more people who are getting started building IoT products. But of course, that might makes sense here. It could still be that maybe they're prototyping the things that are going to come out in a couple of years that are going to get us through the slope of enlightenment and onto the plateau of productivity. But the other thing that we see that sort of doesn't make sense with that place in the industry is how fast our customers are scaling. This is a view of our top 20 customers. And we just did this recently where halfway through the year, so the end of Q2, we looked back and said, okay, we have a bunch of customers who are, who are deploying products with Particle they forecasted that they're going to be delivering some number of units to customers. How are they actually doing, right? And because we're halfway through the year, we said, well, if they're 50% through their plans for the year, then that's good. And then anybody who's doing more than that is exceeding expectations, right? And this is our top 20 customers. And what you see is the vast majority of our customers are scaling faster than they expected, right? All the way up to, and I had to mess with the scale of the graph, 1,200% of what they were expecting to do. But a lot of our customers are doing hundreds of, uh, you know, hundreds of percents, two, three, four, five times what they expected. Keep in mind that 50% is, is good here, right? So 200% means you're doing 400, four times better than you thought you were going to do. And this doesn't really feel like it makes sense if we're in the trough of, uh, the trough of disillusionment, right? How do these two things jive? How can it be that we're going through the tough part of the industry and yet we're seeing customers scale fast? Well, I think that one of the things that I see in the industry, and how we talk about the industry, is that there's a gap between the reality of what people are doing today, the products that people are launching, and the problems they're solving 
today in 2019 versus the vision of what we're hoping to accomplish in this industry over the next five, 10, or more years. And I want to, to, to talk about that, I want to uh, tell a story about a guy named Jeff Bezos. You might have heard of him. This is him. Uh, he's starting a little company called Amazon.com. Uh, and of course, this is the, you know, <laughs> this is the Amazon before most of us knew, knew what Amazon was, right? But if we go back and look at the story of how Amazon came to be, Jeff Bezos was a VP at an investment firm called D.E. Shaw. He was the youngest VP in their history. And the internet was just coming up, it was the mid-90s, and he was asked if he could look into this whole internet thing and figure out what we're gonna do about it, right? He created a bunch of ideas and business plans about various internet businesses that D.E. Shaw could be investing in. And one of them, uh, among the many ideas that Bezos presented, the one that really caught Bezos' boss's fancy was the one that D.E. Shaw employees would later rem remember gained the nickname the Everything Store. The idea was, what if we made a store where you could buy everything online? And this is a quote from the book How the Internet Happened, which, by the way, is a spectacular book about the early history of the internet. It really talks about the true story of where all these companies came from and how they got started, which is fascinating. And of course, they did it. This is the everything store. This is an Amazon warehouse. And I think now, looking back in 2019, you can say, OK, cl clearly this was correct, right? It was, it was, in fact, possible to create a store where you could sell literally everything online. But that wasn't necessarily obvious in the 90s. Bezos quickly decided that an everything store was a bit too grandiose. And so instead, he began investing in product investigating product categories that might be suitable as a proof of concept. So he said, basically went around to all, all the folks he was working with and said, we're gonna make this store, we're gonna connect everything. The everything store was a joke, right? It was like, that's ridiculous, you couldn't possibly do that. So Bezos said, I need to make it smaller. I need to figure out something that I can use to prove that this is going to work. And of course, he picked books. He saw an opportunity where he saw that books are a sort of unique product in their breadth, right? There are an incredible quantity of books but in any given bookstore, even the big ones, right? This was the time of like the big box bookstore, right? Where Barnes and Noble and Borders were taking over from the like small bookstores that preceded them. And they had a huge variety of content. They had more books than any of those small stores, but of course still a small fraction of the books that have been published. And so a lot of the initial value proposition of Amazon.com was, was that you could buy all these obscure books that you couldn't find in a bookstore. And I also love just looking at this, everything about this screams like 1995 or whatever. Um, in particular, I just love that like there was a super room that had, was the computer, of internet, computer and internet books and then there were miles of aisles, right? Which is like, we were still using the metaphor of the physical store because it's like there are, it's kind of like a bookstore that just has so many aisles that you can't even comprehend it, right? We've sort of stopped using that language. Um, but okay, so Amazon decided they're gonna go after books. And even in doing so, that much smaller vision of what their business would become might have felt ludicrous. This is an article uh, from Fortune Magazine in 1997, why Barnes & Noble may crush Amazon. Selling books online with a neat, was a neat concept. The nation's leading bookstore is turning it into a cutthroat business. What's a poor startup to do, right? This, this article obviously did not age well. Uh, instead, Barnes & Noble obviously lost this battle right, and has, and has struggled since, as has a lot of industries that have come into Amazon's field of view, right, as they have pursued their vision of going from being the world's biggest bookstore to the everything store. And the reason I highlight this story is because what it, what it shows is that big opportunities, even the biggest opportunities, Amazon being one of the first companies to reach a trillion dollars in value, start small. And it's not to say that small is relative, right? Building a bookstore is, uh, online is still, is still a pretty big vision. But it's not obvious when you're looking at it how big it might become. And that, I think, is the thing that, that, that ties these two stories together, right? When you look at where we are, where an analyst might think we are versus where we think we are, the gap between the two is that I think what they're looking at is these long-term visions. They're looking at the opportunity that we are all trying to get to in five to 10 years about predictive maintenance and uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning and the ways that those are gonna change our business. And we are still early in that, right? We're not quite there yet. But we are building real products that are solving real problems that give us the opportunity to pursue those bigger visions. And if we look at some of our customers and some of the ways they're doing that, 
we have a customer called SmartFin. SmartFin is a project to monitor the temperature levels in the ocean using fins in, in, uh, on surfboards. Now, the reason for this is they're trying to crowdsource better information about what's actually hap happening with climate change. And so they're, they're selling fins that you can attach to your uh, that you can attach to your surfboard that will help collect better information about what's actually happening. It's a really interesting way of trying to collect that information because surfers are A, all over the world, and B, are uniquely interested in making sure that it, we get better information about what's actually happening with the climate. Right? We all care about the climate, but if you're a surfer, you might care about it just a little bit more. And so it's a really good audience to deliver this product. But you can imagine how the larger scale opportunity is to say, how can we just generally deploy sensors to collect better information about what's happening in the physical world in creative ways, right? This is just one way to get this kind of sensor in the world. But there's a lot of other ways we're, we're seeing folks push out sensors to collect information about what's happening in the physical world. You're gonna be hearing today from one from Shifted Energy. It's a company that does demand response systems with water heaters. So they can connect a, uh, a water heater to the internet and in doing so, they can offer opportunities for the utility companies to control the flow of energy into and out from that water heater to make sure that you get a hot shower, but also it requires less energy where the water heater is heated at the right times, but isn't heated when you don't need it. Now this is a great example of, this is a particular application of demand response, but you can see how more broadly, if more and more of the machines that operate in, whether it's at home, or in commercial and industrial contexts. These machines that consume energy, if you have better information, better control systems, and you can think about what the energy cost is and incorporate that into how that machine is being used, it's a big opportunity. What we see in the market is real products with clear short-term impact that are solving immediate and obvious problems today, but that have massive potential behind them that will be that growth that we see in the Gartner hype cycle of sort of you know, growing into the, the, uh, uh, the plateau of, of productivity. Some examples of that. You're gonna be hearing from a customer of ours called Watsco today. Mario Cruz is gonna be on stage talking about what they're doing there. Watsco is an HVAC distributor. And they're, responsible for, they're, they're responsible for installing and servicing and maintaining air conditioners and heating systems in, in, in homes around the country. Now, the product they've built, Century, today is about collecting information about when those machines break or are likely to break and fixing them as soon as possible, right? If any of you have had an air conditioner break, you know that probably the day that it broke was the day that you needed it the most on the hottest day of the summer, right? Uh, by being able to, of course, that means that when it breaks, it creates problems. If they can fix it more quickly, that's extremely valuable to you as the user of the product. But it also creates an opportunity for prediction, right? Eventually, eventually this grows into being able to predict when failure is likely to happen because you have enough information about the leading indicators of failure that allow you to start to um, fix problems before they occur. Using Jacuzzi as an example, the immediate and obvious value is remote control, which is to say, as I, as I said earlier, it's valuable if you own a hot tub to be able to control it remotely. But of course, the longer term opportunity is to say that you don't need to control it anymore, but that behavior is automated. And I apologize for the clip art representing automation as a crystal ball, the best I could come up with. But the idea is that if we know that every Friday you come home and you turn your hot tub on and we collect that data over time, then at some point you start saying, I'm just gonna turn your hot tub on on Friday and I'm gonna send you a notification that I turned it on. If you don't want it to be on, then hit this button and we will, you know, we'll cancel that action, right? We can start to automate the behaviors that initially happen manually. We have a customer called Dentalese. Dentalese is a manufacturer of dental operatory equipment. They make machines that go in dentist offices, which if you're not a dentist is probably not something you think a lot about. But of course those machines are very important and valuable if you are a dentist they're also not something you necessarily want to worry about, right? You didn't get into the field of dentistry because you really care about this machine, which is called a dental compressor, and the dental compressor powers all the other equipment in the dentist's office. If the machine fails, they lose a lot of lost revenue because they have to reschedule all their appointments until they can get somebody out to replace the machine because all the other equipment stopped working. Now, the immediate value is to, is, is to uh, make the truck roll more efficient, which is to say when somebody goes out and fixes this machine, they can do so, again, at the right time in the right way. 
But over time, as we collect more information about what's happening inside these machines, maybe we can fix those issues with a software update. Maybe the person doesn't even need to go out there at all. And then finally, you'll be hearing from, uh, from a customer of ours, Fetch. Fetch is cr uh, creating a, a solution to have trucks and vans all over the country that are deployed. You can go pick them up, and you can sort of rent them from the owners of, uh, of these fleets of trucks, right? So somebody can say, I'm not using my truck all that often. I'm going to allow, put it into a marketplace that means that if you need to borrow a pickup truck, maybe it's because you're doing a Home Depot run or because you're a contractor and your, and your truck broke down, uh, you can now essentially borrow somebody else's in sort of a peer-to-peer -peer marketplace. That allows us to take these fixed assets that are expensive and share them with one another, and that's usually valuable. But you can imagine how over time, with better information about what's happening with these trucks, we can figure out where they should be going, right? Who's requesting them? When do people pull out the app? Where are they when they do so? And therefore, where should these trucks be, right? What's the best place to put this so that somebody can, uh, will have access to it when they need it? The thing that we see happening over and over again is companies that are building products to solve today's problems. They have very specific, discrete problems that they know that they can solve today with the, exist the, the technology they already have. But they're also doing so in ways where they're designing for tomorrow's opportunities, right? There's this longer term vision and opportunity that sits behind today's product. That's really where the excitement is, right? It's like, we can do this, but then we'll be able to do that. Now the commonality between all these is uh, in terms of what you need to do, right? So what should you do if you're building a product and how do you split your focus between focusing on today's problem versus tomorrow's problem? Well, what we see happening and what we encourage our customers to do is to say, for now, focus on the product that you're creating today. This is the example of the bookstore, right? Before you go and scale and build the everything store, you have to beat Barnes and Noble, right? And once you do that, that gives you the opportunity to expand into other categories. And I think that's exactly the same idea for every one of these IoT products, which is the first thing that has to happen before you get to that vision, is you have to get the product into the market, right? You have to solve enough of a problem today that people want this thing and they deploy it and your customers will buy it. But make sure that you're collecting the information that comes out of that product because every data point that you collect today will help you do the things you want to do tomorrow. The common thread between all of these long-term opportunities is that there's some level of data collection and prediction that needs to happen, right? I think with AI and ML, one of the challenges is that in a lot of cases, we don't yet have the data sets that we need to solve these problems. We can't predict the behavior. We can't predict the failure because we don't yet have enough data. So you can't, in many cases, you, we might not have enough information to be able to deliver a predictive solution today. But if we start collecting data today, then at some point we will have enough information and you'll be able to deliver a product that can solve a new set of problems. Or even that same product with just better information all of a sudden has a new value proposition. This idea of solving today's problems but being ready for tomorrow's problems is baked into our platform, which is to say, the technology challenges we focused on solving for, for you, for our customers, are the problems that you experience when you try and create a product today, right? Uh, which is to say, we're trying to help you connect your products, and that's the first step, right? And we need, to, we need to provide a solution that covers the challenges in the device, in the cloud, and the network in between in order to get these products online. But we also want to do so in a way that opens the door for future opportunities. All the data can flow out of Particle from day one into whatever systems you want to use, however you collect information. Everything is controlled through an API. So as you start to expand the use cases and introduce other applications, you can do so because these are API-connected products. Everything is over-the-air software updatable. You ship the product and you figure out you want to do something else with it, you can change it. You can push out a software update and change the behavior of the device at any point in the future. 